Mrs. Ibuku Owoshika is an African entrepreneur, author, international leader, and a global cultural shaper. She is the chairman and founder of the Chair Center Group, a lead in furniture and security system provider in Nigeria. With an undergraduate degree in chemistry from the University of Ife and an advanced degree from various global institutions, including Lagos Business School, IESE Business School, Wharton, and China European International Business School, CEIBS. In addition to her work leading businesses, Mrs. Awoshik is also committed to serving nations. She was recently appointed to the UK G7 Impact Task Force and the Global Steering Group for Impact and Investing, GSG. She is a member of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group and serves on the Pioneer Board of the Nigerian Sovereign Wealth Fund. Over the years, she has received numerous awards locally and internationally. Her most recent recognition are the 2020 Forbes Women African Chairperson Award and the Beta Gamma Sigma 2020 Business Achievement Award. Mrs. Ibukuma Woshika is a recipient of four honorary doctoral degrees and has spoken at numerous world conferences and platforms, including the Global Leadership Summit, where she shares her knowledge on several economic, leadership, and faith-based topics. She is the founder of Ibukuma Woshika Leadership Academy, governor of the International Women's Leadership Conference in Dubai, also the founder of the Christian Missionary Fund, a faith-based organization that works with hundreds of missionaries spread across Nigeria to change the lives through the provisions of medical, educational, and general relief. Mrs. Awoshika has multiple expressions beyond the boardroom. She's a seasoned author and shapes cultures through her active involvement in media and purposeful entertainment. She is featured in the highly rated Netflix original blockbuster movie, Citation, and was an executive producer of God Calling, another exceptional movie which was released on Netflix in 2020. She is happily married to Mr. Abiodun Awoshika, and they are blessed with three wonderful sons. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Ibukun Awoshika. Good evening, everyone. I hope that uh, no matter where you are, evening makes sense to you at this point in time. I'd really like to thank uh, Pastor Dutola and his beautiful wife and the family of Jesus House Baltimore for the invitation to be part of this great conference that you're hosting. Uh, it's a very uh, dynamic topic, and I see that all the different speakers and the different parts of the topic will do justice to giving a complete picture to everyone in terms of uh, what is needed, where um, leadership is concerned. Now, my topic for this evening is about balancing personal and professional life in leadership. What is leadership in itself? Is the ability to influence a group or individual persons in the fulfillment or the achievement of a goal. It's the commitment um, of individuals who are so empowered to use the resources of their time, their talents, their skills, and their opportunity to help bring together the talents of others, of an individual in other, to achieve a goal. Now, when we're talking about balancing your personal and your professional life, where I would really like to start from is in talking about what that personal and what the professional uh, life is. And a lot of times, a lot of people live without articulating what it is exactly that they're trying to do. We can continue to do stuff and be busy and seem successful, you know, in the context of life without being sure if in actual fact we're being true to ourselves and to our end goal. 
So I would start by asking a few questions just for you to sort of uh, think through as a leader, what is important to you? What is your set goal? What are you trying to balance? Because you might be, it might seem like you're balancing stuff, but are you balancing the things that are your set goals where your life is concerned? And I think for all of us, whether male or female, there are three key components to our lives. If you're a woman, for example, you have your life as you, as an individual, a person with your vision, with your ambition, with your dreams. When you were born, you went to school, you had reasons for liking some subjects, not than others, focusing on some, you made a choice for a university degree, you sort of made a decision of a career, and you moved from that to continue to build into the place where you get to leadership. So there are things that personally, as, a pers as an individual, that are important to you, that are key, that you would like to achieve. Now, for a woman, your second component is if you do decide to get married and you get married, then you have commitment in your role as a wife or as a man, as a husband. And that in itself has different, should have different and separate goals. Now, have we even articulated what those goals are in terms of in my role as a wife or as a husband, what have I set out to achieve? And then the third leg of this is if we're a father or a mother, then what have we set out to achieve as our goal, plain, that role in the life of our children. Now, those three balls of you as a person, your vision, your ambition, your dreams, your goals, you as a wife or as a husband, and you as a father or as a mother, those three balls need to be afloat somehow. And your goal in life is that you do not want to drop any one of them because it would always seem like there's a loss of some sort if you drop one. Now, the reality for most people, which is a challenge in thinking about it is, how can we keep three balls afloat when we have two hands? How do we keep things working together when indeed we have 24 hours, all of which is not available for us to function? Now, what that then requires is that we do need to then sit down and sort of have a conversation with ourselves. Because you see, if you don't know where you're going, how will you get there? So if we don't set parameters, you will not know what success looks like for you when you get to it. So it becomes then important for us to sit down and ask ourselves, where am I right now? So some of these questions you can write down and just sit down later, think about it. Try to write the answers to yourself. Try to articulate your thoughts concerning them so that when you have the answers all together, you can try to bring them together to find where are the areas of conflict and what are my mitigants for resolving those conflicts in terms of what is important to me. So where am I right now? You need to assess your current position. Having done that, you want to go on to ask yourself, you know, where, who do I think that I am as a person? You know, self-identify who you are, and that might help you to reflect in terms of what your goals are. And then to ask yourself, where exactly am I going? Why is that question critical? Life always offers us options. There are always option A, option B, option C, option D. Many times we're at a junction and there's a conflict. And in life, we always find that there are opportunity costs. And in making the right decision as to what it is 
that we sacrifice for the other, what are our considerations that guide those decisions? Because if we're trying to find a balance, we must know what are the things that are key. Why one thing is more important than the other. Why one choice is principal and not the other. So as we're looking at our different uh, options, we must have parameters that help us to decide what to choose. Now, one of my favorite questions is always to then say, how do you want to finish? I don't know what your age is right now, but maybe when you're 70, you're 80, you're 90, you're 100, choose whatever is your own goal and have a conversation with yourself. If today were my last day and I had to take stock of my entire life, what would I like to read in the story of my life? How would I like my story told as my complete and final story? So that's a gift question because we're talking about the life that you have not lived yet, but that you have a chance to dream about it and articulate and lay down what your dream is. Now, the reason that is important is when you take where you are now and you take where you want to end, you're able to then have a gaps analysis that helps you to determine what is missing between where I am now and where I want to end. What do I need to do in order to achieve that end game that I'm dreaming about? What do resources do I need to put into play? What education do I need? What relationships do I need? What support system do I need? What do I need to undo or what do I need to start doing? We can do a serious analysis of where the gaps are and then strategically decide what are the necessary mitigants that we must take in other that we must put in place in order to ensure that we're able to finish in the place that we would like to now the process of we have talked about right now is to help us then begin to consider what is important that i must uh, focus on in terms of trying to achieve uh, a balance between my personal life and my professional life. If I've answered some of the questions we've talked about, I should be able to identify what are my key commitments, what are my must do, what are the things that are non-negotiable in my personal life. And then in the context of my career or my business or my roles as a leader outside of my personal relationships. What are the things there that I must do for me? What are the things that we cannot trade? You know, how do we extend ourselves beyond our immediate human capacity in order to still achieve those things that in the process of answering those questions, we have identified as key. Now, one of the things I have learned is to then realize that I'm not a superwoman. I don't know one. Maybe some will deceive themselves to think that they're supermen or superwomen. And whenever we do that, we actually set ourselves up for trouble. Society or community or people like to encourage you to think like you're one. And what they do in doing that is to put a burden on you for you to try to prove yourself beyond human capacity to impress other people. You have no business trying to impress anyone. You know, what is important is that you are true to yourself, that the life that you have chosen, that you have articulated is the life that you want for yourself. The things you have considered to be important to you, that is what you apply your biggest currency to. And what is our big, when we're talking about balancing, 
our biggest currency is time. And to me, time is what we call it, but time really is life. Every time you've seen a birth certificate of anyone, it says time of birth. It's usually to the last second. If you see someone's death certificate as well, you will see time of death. It's usually to the last second as well. So basically, you can calculate for any human being the amount of time they have been given for which they have lived. So if you live for 10 years, it's 10 years times 12 months, uh, times the 365 days that is in it, times the 24 hours in each day, times 60 minutes, 60 seconds in whatever unit of time you wanted. And you'll get the exact time of what your life represents. So it's a direct equivalent, time and life. And therefore, it's the only currency we expend every day that is not recoverable. Because every minute that we allow to go is gone forever. If you think you're replacing it with another, no, there's an opportunity cost to that. Because whatever time you're using to do what you should do yesterday, there's something you're giving up you can be doing today for which you're applying that time to. So time is a key currency here. And deciding the things that are crucial for you being true to yourself, the things that are most expedient and important in your life, then becomes important because in applying that time of your life, you can decide what you apply it to and you can know the things that are they're great they're, they would be good to do but they're not important they're not more important than the things you have chosen to commit to so when we talk about balance the way i see it it's about finding the balance each day for the things that are most important to you and also then deciding how do i extend myself once i've accepted the fact that I am not a superwoman, a superman. I'm not the most important person on the face of the earth. What it teaches me is to value other people, to treat them like they're important because I need them in order to complete the things I want to do and be able to have some sort of attainment of balancing of my personal and my professional life. Now, as a leader, I have an advantage because the real advantage of being a leader is I am not standing alone. I have the advantage of resources, whether human or otherwise. Even if I have otherwise, if I have financial resources, I can convert my financial resources into human assets. But when I convert it into human asset, it's about how do I then empower the human assets in my life to add value to my process of trying to achieve the things I have set for myself as important. If I'm honest with myself and I identify that people are the biggest asset that I have, then I will treat every human being in my total environment who has the capacity to contribute real value to my life. I will treat them as assets that are key for me to be able to attain the balance that I seek and to have a successful life. You know, I'm a, I'm a graduate of chemistry and at the end of the day, everything is science to me. And I always look at the life of a human being in the form of equation. I, I look at myself as a human being, as the equation of me is you or me, whichever one you like, were equal to assets, which are my strengths, plus liabilities, which are my weaknesses. Now, for me to fully succeed in life and achieve that balance that can, you know, make me look like a successful leader in whatever I've put my hands to do, then I need to be equal to asset plus asset. I must have those factors working together for me. 
But as a human being, I just have one line of asset and my second leg, their liabilities. So how do I make up for my liabilities, which are my weaknesses? Well, in reality, the only way I get the other assets to complement my own asset is when other people who work for me or who serve me willingly give their own asset to make up for my liabilities in order to complete me to succeed. Now, what that teaches me is that I must value people. I must treat people right. I must treat people with respect. I must treat people like they matter. I must make them feel good in their service to me in any form such that they will willingly give of their own talents, of their own gift, of their own asset to complement my own liabilities and help me to succeed. If I'm going to a meeting and I'm still, I'm sitting in the car and I'm still reading some papers trying to uh, wrap my, my head around the things that are important for that meeting. Why am I able to do that? If I have a driver who is driving me, who takes away the distraction and the labor of driving, I live in Lagos, of driving in a city like Lagos, the traffic and all of that away from me, such that the time, whether it takes two hours or three hours to get to location, becomes free time for me to apply to what I have considered important. That's a value given to me. When we arrive at destination, I will step out of the car. I don't even think I have to look back to think about how is my car going to be parked? Who is going to look after it? Why? Because someone has taken that burden off me. It doesn't matter that I pay for it. It matters that they're willing to do it and do it well and give me value such that I can have the rest of mind at that point and not the stress of driving. I can travel on a trip. I'm speaking to you from somewhere in the world other than where I live right now. But it's possible that whilst I'm here, you know, my family is at home. And as the mother in the house, I do have a responsibility to ensure that my household is kept and maintained and provided for. And if I have a cook or nannies or housekeepers looking after those matters, they are extending my hand by their service and they are taking off me certain things that I would ordinarily have had to worry and labor over. And therefore, it's easy for me to be able to do some other things. Now, what does that tell us? In trying to find the balance, one, we need help. So we need help from our human assets. And we must find, we must labor to find the right human assets in our lives. I always say, work out your own salvation, as the Bible says. In working out our salvation is that once we have identified what our goal is, what is important to us, what we consider that we must achieve, in all the three different areas of our lives, we then plan how to find the resources that complement our resources, our time, our energy, our skills, our talent. We find other time, other people's time, other people's talent, other people's giftings that will then work together to ensure that we're able to keep the things that necessarily need to work together, but that we are unable to do at the same time concurrently. We create a concurrent system that works in our life through planning, through right hiring or right assigning. Because, you know, sometimes we actually have people hired around us to do things. Or sometimes we're so consumed with self that we do not willingly delegate to other people. And that's something we need to deal with where we're concerned. You know, there's a sense of self-importance that makes us feel, oh, if I don't do it, 
it cannot be done. You know, if it's not me, it's not done right. You're going to die. If you die, life goes on. That's just the honest truth. You know, so I don't see, I don't know one human being that's indispensable. Except we kid and deceive ourselves that we are. If I take it back on a national level, one of the biggest losses for us as a nation, which has contributed to our deficit of jobs in our country, is that over time, we raised a, a number of great entrepreneurs who were brilliant at building organizations, but they built it around themselves. They didn't know how to build around them without them. It was a matter of what they could do such that they raised, they had human resources, but they turned their human resources into robots. People who were not allowed to use um, their own imagination, who were raised to only obey instructions. And therefore, there are books written about this. A number of those kind of amazing entrepreneurs that we raised as a country, every time they died, the businesses died with them. Not because there are no people around them, but it's simply because they just don't know how to, you know, make things work around them without them. Sometimes it happens in homes. Husbands who do not have the grace and the liberty to build up their wives or their immediate support system, that everything about their business is them. Their wives, their children have no ability to take any clear decisions in it because it's how it's been structured. You know, we become gods because we do not know how to create a system rather than a dependency. And once we cannot create a system, we're unable to find balance on both sides, on the different sides of our life. Because in reality, there are multiple sides to our lives. You know, I, I, uh, where I am today, I had to speak at a university and there were a lot of um, young people at this session, and we were talking about women leadership and entrepreneurship. And they were told to engage me in a question and answer session for an extended you know, period of time. And one of the questions asked by one of the professors at the university at a point, she asked me, you know, I've read your CV, I listened to all the intro on you, I've listened to what you've shared here, and I realized you do so many things. How do you do it? How is it even possible for you to do all of those things? And this is a question I get asked very often, you know, and the honest truth is, I know my own limits. I know my strengths, but I also know my weaknesses. And what I always say to people is, look, as a person, I'm very self-aware. I do not play to my weaknesses at all. I play to my strengths. I outsource my weaknesses. And in outsourcing my weaknesses, I expect to achieve maximum performance in my weaknesses because my responsibility is to find other people who are better than me in my weaknesses to perform the roles that I'm weak at. That way, I can achieve the best on all fronts. And I have absolutely no attachment to anything in such a way that I'm unable to delegate. Now, the reality is, which is how you begin to find the balance. What are the things I cannot delegate? I cannot delegate being a mother to my children. So for as many years, maybe about 15, 16 years, my last one is still in uni in England. But for as many years as my kids were at school in England, as difficult as it was, I made sure 
I showed up for every parents' meeting, every half-term, every exit that I was required to. And because I just don't think anybody can stand as my children's mother. Now, if I'm dead, that would be understandable because then somebody is going to have to feel that gap. So even that is something that works in some context and situation, you have to give it up for somebody else to do for you. But in terms of my opportunity cost, I would make the choices because my children cannot readily have another mother. So that's not something that is easy for me to outsource. I cannot outsource being around my husband when I am really needed. So I have to, in the scheme of things, work out a plan that helps me to be there and yet be able to do some of the things I need to do. In some of those cases, you know, you make choices that make it easy for you to combine, to combine things. I have responsibilities, uh, commitments for this whole week in the country that I'm in right now. And my husband, I would have traveled for a week. My husband would have been in another location. And what made sense for us, we agreed, why don't we go on this trip together? So even though I have work to do, we're together. He can do some other stuff while I'm uh, doing the thing I'm here for. He, once he has his own laptop, he can work from anywhere around the world. But yet, we wake up together, we spend time together in the morning before I go off. You know, by the time I come back in the evening, he's had some time around, he's had some time to work, he's had some time around, and we spend the rest of the day together. We're trying to make things work around the things we have. We respect as important for one another without shirking those responsibilities. Now, there's some things you're going to have to trade off. I think maybe last week, Saturday, I was in late, spent the entire day teaching a session for, I don't know how many young people, both physically in the room and hundreds of others virtually connected from around the world for about seven hours. I consider that important in the context of what I have evaluated are my life assignments and my key leadership roles to influence generations for God. And because of that, if there were any social functions to which I was invited on that day within the hours that I had that commitment, those ones will be sacrificed. So there are always opportunity cost, which is why I asked you those questions at the beginning. Because when you go through the process of identifying and curating and coming to a clear sense of what your priorities are, it becomes easier to make decisions as to the things that you will apply your limited resource of time to every time they're in conflict with another. The other thing that I've always done, which I share with those close to me to do, take time to sit down and write the order of priority in your life. Write it down. When you do, you would not be conflicted about what you're trying to balance, even between your work and your family. My personal order of priority, one is God. And when I say God, I don't mean church. I'm always clear about that because sometimes, you know, we mix them up and we get carried away. God for me is 24 seven. It doesn't matter where I am around the world. God is my number one agenda. And so that's a relationship that I will protect and nurture. Number two is my family. And when it comes to my family, that even has its own categories. So right after God in my life is my husband and my three sons. After them, 
then I begin to, you know, line out my siblings and all of that, other relationships, find their ranking in all of that. After that would be my commercial commitments. If I make a business commitment to serve on this board, on that board, to run this organization or that, I have a contractual commitment. I must make sure that I keep my word in those commitments. After that, I can line up church and stuff like that. The reason I made the distinction between God and church, church is my place of service to God, but it's not my God relationship. So I might not be in church sometimes, but I'm never away from God. And I need to come to manage that because in particular, I find that for a lot of church girls like us, a lot of women in particular get into trouble because sometimes we cannot uh, balance them together. Work where we're paid our salaries that we've made a commitment to do, we will not be diligent with it because we want to be able to give time to some things in church. And there's nothing wrong with us serving in church, but we must always understand our priorities and find the balance between it. If I'm on leave and I spend all my time in church, that's fine. But the Bible says we must also be fair and we must be just with those uh, to which uh, our wages are paid from. You know, the Bible says, show me a man that is diligent in his ways. We will stand before kings and not before mere men. And if we are children of God and therefore ambassadors of Christ, we cannot lie at work in order to do a service in church. And I'm sure that we can organize ourselves to do our part in church, but we must do it honestly in a way that there isn't a conflict where our leadership roles do not conflict. Otherwise, it means that we're in a permanent, we're in a full-time role in a church, and that's fine. You know, so we must make those clear decisions as to what are the order of priorities in our lives and apply our limited resource, which is time, to them as leaders. And why is this even more important for us as leaders? Because we are the examples. We are the examples that communicate and teach others around us. We are the ones that set the pace and interpret the scriptures by the way we live for others. We're the ones who are preaching without being on the pulpit. Because the way we live, the things we do, the examples we give as leaders in church means we are giving the right or the wrong examples. But whatever we do, we do it in the name of the Lord. Either we represent him well or we represent him wrongly. So we need to find the balance and what is true uh, in the situation finding the balance between our personal life and our leadership roles. You know, we are leaders even in our homes in, in many ways. So because in our homes, we influence those that work for us at home. We influence our children in terms of the goals that we set for them, even as we influence in corporate or business world or political world that we're in. But what we're balancing is about what we have identified in the first instance to be important. And when, once we first sort out the places of our conflicts and decide, you know what, these are my priorities. These are the things in terms of what I would apply my social time to. I would rather be speaking to some young people somewhere or be in a church preaching or doing something about development and all of that than sitting at a Lagos party for 10 hours. Those are my priorities. They're decisions that I've made. So I don't have to think twice whenever those things, you know, are in conflict. I know what my choice is and what my priority is. I would go the extra mile 
in order to make those other things happen. It's the same as I'm doing this today. Frankly, it's an extra mile decision for me. But every opportunity to use the gift of God in my life to bless other people, that's an opportunity to serve God. Those are my God moments. And sometimes there will be sacrifices for that. So it's important that we have a meeting with ourselves and be true to ourselves about what is it that, whether we're 70, 80, 90, or 100 years old today, I would have a great smile and a grin on my face if I'm looking back at my life and I look at the things that I've done, how my story is being told. Will I be happy that this is what is in it? Or will I be sad if it's something else? And once I make that decision, I then decide what it is I'm trying to balance without forsaking my order of priority, as I've set it up. So no matter how much a training opportunity or a developmental opportunity is attracted, if I have an assignment that concerns my children or my husband on that day and is important, then that would have to wait because my other priority says to me that that is the most important thing on that day. Can I find other ways to do it? I always try. Can we reschedule it for another day? Yes, we can. But when the chips are down, my balance is around the order of priority for my life as I have perceived that the Lord has assigned me to things that I consider important. And therefore, I make those decisions uh, considering that. So for you, it might be different. But what is important is that you find your own life priorities. You find your own balls that must stay afloat. Whether it's the ball of being a father, being a mother, being a business person, being a career person, or the ball of you. Because, you know, sometimes we're so consumed with being a father, being a mother, being a business person, being a, a career person, that we actually don't think about ourselves. You know, and without you, all of the other things fall apart. You cannot give what you do not have. So in trying to understand what your balance means as a leader, don't ever act as if the world will die without you, because it will not. If you die today, people will come and visit. But after a few minutes of sadness, the same people will sit on the side and they will smile and they will chat. They mean well, but the reality is life goes on. And that's just what it is. It's a circle, it keeps going. People fall off at different stages, but life goes on and you must recognize that. So spend time to decide the things that are most important to you and apply yourself to it. Remember that you're not invisible. There's a lot of support system in the world. Use it. Delegate to others. The joy of a leader who masters delegation. In fact, the victory of a leader who masters delegation is in being able to harness the talents and the gifts of even people that are smarter than you, who work under you or for you. Harness them together as your success story. Because when the chips are down, you're still the winner. When your team wins, you win. Whatever they do well, you've done well. Because everything they did, they did under your watch. And all of that, you must have the grace to know how to let people around you express themselves so you can spend some of your time doing a few other things. So in rounding off, determine where you are right now, determine where you're going, Determine um, what is between where you are and where you want to get to at 70, 80, or 90, or whatever age you choose. You know, find your key uh, balls in your life and find your support system that represent the other assets that make up the weaknesses 
of your life and freely delegate and assign others to support your life and do other things for you so you can focus on the areas of your strength while bringing it all together as the leader of the pack to achieve the goals that you set out at the beginning to. That's about as much as we can say within the time which have been allocated. And a lot of the work is work that you'll have to do when you sit with yourself thereafter. So I hope you find one or two things that bless you in our conversation. Wow, that was simply amazing. Thank you so much, Mrs. Awoshika. That was empowering, it was enlightening, it was practical. I was taking notes ferociously, and, and, and so we want to say thank you so much for such an empowering session. We, we are going to segue real quick into just asking you some more questions, but what you have already deposited this, uh, for this session has been very, very usable, I would say. That's the word I'll, I'll, I'll use, usable. You can use it in, in, in your professional life, in your personal life. And, and we've seen that you've done a whole lot of that yourself because you gave us exactly how you did it, right? And we know the bio told us a whole lot about you. We know you to be an entrepreneur, a king of enterprise, you know, a leader in the industry. We know you to be a chairman, board member on many boards. And even in the movie sphere, you, you're, you're, you're a player now. I remember watching God Calling and I saw you and I was like, wow. <laughs> and, and these are all impressive things. And definitely we know that you have had to apply yourself and, and with all the myriads of things that you've had to do, reached an, an amount of balance. So we're grateful that you had the opportunity to share with us just some of your tips in getting there. But we know all these things. We also know that to reach the pinnacle of anything, there's always a story. You know, we, we often say, what's the story behind your glory? And so we'd just like to know a little bit more of how you got there. We know you're the chairman of the uh, Chair Center Group. And we know that it must have been a journey because no good thing happens just, you know, with a snap of a hand. <laughs> so, so we'd really like to know you a little bit more, know a little bit more about how you took your journey and how you got to where you are right now. So if you don't mind, please, would you share with us briefly? Okay, well, that's a 60-year-old story you're trying to get to 60 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> but we'll try. Well, I think... Basically, I um, maybe I, I was opportuned to first have uh, a father in particular who raised his girls to think there was nothing we couldn't do in our life, and that was key. And um, two, that I learned in that process to be quick with making decisions and making choices. Uh, whenever I discover that um, there's something I don't want to do, I don't sit around it. I just move on because I just realized, okay, that's not what I want to do. But I wasn't always so sure of what I wanted to do. I mean, if I tell my story, secondary school, I wanted to be a doctor, realized they use real medical, real dead bodies in medical school. And I thought, oh, bad idea. I'm not doing this, you know, and that was the end of the story. Decided then I wanted to... Uh, be uh, an architect. Anyway, I ended up going to university to study chemistry. And uh, by the end of my first year of chemistry, I realized how much I hated it. You know, I could pass it, but I just didn't love it. Then I thought, well, I was very good at debating in secondary school. Everybody thought I'd make a good lawyer. So I thought, okay, I'd like to change the law. I, I used to go and sit in front of the uh, dean of law's office for days and his secretary told me there's this girl that's been coming to sit here you need to see her so he saw me and said what do you want and i said i want to change the law and he said that's why you've been sitting out of my outside of my office i said yes the guy looked at me and thought you know what i like your guts if i only take one person in law next session it will be you but make sure you pass very well well that's the problem if i pass very well my department will never release me and if i failed he was never going to take me so anyway, by the end of that session, I changed my mind. I wanted to, decided now I wanted to be an accountant so I could go and work in a bank. I took uh, free electives in the Faculty of Admin and Accounting till my final year. Went on to youth service, you know, determined to serve in an accounting firm. Already got uh, an arrangement to serve at Akintola Williams and Co. But NYC had a different idea. They sent me to go and teach in a school. Of course, I got myself rejected. <laughs> 
and one day rejected me. I, I went, uh, I just wore a dress off my shoulder and it was a very religious call. So they immediately just sent me back, which was the plan anyway. So I went back there and sat down until they posted me to where I really wanted to come. But if you think that I did all that, that that would not be, you know, my best moment of life. For the one year I served in uh, the accounting firm, I hated it. It was boring for me. You know, there wasn't much of personal initiative and thinking, you just have to follow all sort of processes. And I just thought, no, this is not me. I like to use my brain, you know. So, but I always, my rule is whatever my hands find to do, I do it well. So once mm -hmm. uh, I did my job, so at the end of the year, they offered me a permanent position. I said, thank you, but no thank you, and walked away. And uh, I went back home wanting to find a job. Still would like to work in a bank, but... Uh, and maybe do something else and not uh, have to be a chartered accountant. Anyway, my first job one week after youth call was in a furniture company. So I thought, let me kill time while waiting for my bank job. Well, I lasted three and a half months there and realized within that period why I had wanted to study architecture because everything came together. You know, I loved the creativity, all the... Uh, manufacturing process fascinated me, transformation of space and all of that. But I didn't like the value system of the company. And because I didn't, I thought, you know what, I can do what they do and do it well. But I got to see the heart and the inside of a company, of a manufacturing company in furniture. And I went out, I, I was there, I went to, it was just before my 26th birthday, and went to set up uh, my own company at the tiniest version of it to start. Anyway, that's what grew over 35 years to become, you know, what my uh, manufacturing group is. And uh, I had certain things that were important to me when I was doing that. As a young woman, I was a bit idealistic. So I had two key things. I, I said to myself, I was never going to sleep with a man to get a job, nor was I ever going to pay a bribe. And everybody thought that I was just such an idealistic girl. I wasn't going to go find business. Well, it did serve me well over time. I stuck to my gun. Sometimes it was difficult to be those things. But luckily, you know, I met the Lord like a year or two into my business. So I found the learnings, you know, and uh, the grace through the word of God to stand in my belief system and to continue to pursue uh, and to build my business. And then getting married to an amazing guy added a lot of value because then I got the right kind of support and encouragement. And it would be 33 years since I've been married in December. Wow. And that all worked together to help um, my career. And at a stage, you know, the market had a need for people with good experience in different areas, but who also had the right value system. And though I did those things based on my faith and my conviction, they became assets that made me attractive to corporate organizations to invite me to serve on their boards. And, you know, one thing led to the other, and the rest of my life is uh, an open book uh, story. So, sort of, that's it. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, great. So, so here, I understand something from what you've said, and that's that things built up for you over time in the direction of where you wanted to go. But today we're talking about balancing your personal and your professional life. I know that there probably was a time when you didn't have this amount of understanding that you had or you have now. And the heavens, as they say, has just opened unto you and these different things are coming your way. So there is definitely a challenge with how do I then at this point as a young lady, the young lady that that has just come into this, but still has to keep her home and now has different new opportunities open to her. And that's where a whole lot of people who are joining us today are at, where they're saying, okay, I have several opportunities open to me and I'm already almost saturated um, as it is. This is a challenge. We live in a very fast paced world, a world where, you know, everything is calling for our attention. So, the Mrs. Ibukumawushika at that time versus the Mrs. Ibukumawushika now. 
how did you close that gap? You've, you've spoken to some of the things, but just coming to this place where this person, let's say myself now is, what would you say, ma'am? Okay, first and foremost, come to terms with the fact that you're not invisible. Okay, so when you recognize your own humanity and your vulnerabilities, you know your limits. But you want to do more than that limit allows. Okay, which is what you want to do as a young, ambitious person. Okay, now what you do in accepting your own limits, and I think that's one of the grace that I think God gave me early to know that, okay, I want to do this, but I can't do all of this by myself. So it taught me to develop what I call my discounting policy. Okay, like I'm not looking for a perfect house help because she doesn't exist. But I need to make sure that there's support system in my house. And therefore, I'm a lot more accommodating because I know that I'd rather get a 60% value out of someone that, and that value serves my purpose than to put myself under so much pressure looking for a 100% person. Mm. So you, you face, you, you look at things more in context and you also reconsider how you make certain decisions. I had uh, relatives, cousins stay with me because I knew that if I had a sudden house help crisis, my family members staying with me as a support system, we're not going anywhere. And therefore a house help can get up and say, I'm going today. I might be on my way to the airport going somewhere. Mm -hmm. I, I have a fallback position that I've created, which is part of the planning that we must put in place. Now, there's something I always say to the girls when I mentor sessions as well is this. Look, all these things you want to do means that you want to make some money doing it. Then send the money on errand. If mm. you're going to achieve those things you want to do, you must also have the grace to know how to use those resources as tools. For me, I consider money as just a tool. You use it as a tool to achieve the things you consider important to you, which is part of why I talked about you declaring what your uh, order of priority is, the things that are important in your life, the non-tradable factors. Once you have identified those, then put your resources to work, to guard them, to make sure they work. My mother-in-law and I lived together for 20 years. I find a lot of young girls like, hey, you live with your mother. And I'm like, she's not a witch. She was the greatest blessing in my life. You know, she really did bless my life in many ways. It was, it made it so much easier for me to focus. I knew that whatever was going on in my house as I was traveling back and forth, there was a matured adult who loved my children, maybe even more than I did in my house, who kept the peace for me as I had this support system of, family i also had the domestic staff and all of that so you you must pay attention to so when i say you know work out your own salvation it is when you make the choices of what you want to do you must also apply yourself to plan what makes them work no matter what age you're in when i was about 31 and i went to have my second son I remember at that point I decided, you know what? I want to have a life, but yet I want to build my business. And for me to do that, I must learn how to detach myself from the business so that the business was not me. And I decided from that point, I would go away every year for six weeks and I would not look back. And that whoever the people are that were in the business, they have to keep the business going. So when they call me during those periods, I'm like, what will I do if I'm there? I'm going to think of a solution. Guys, go and think of a solution too. And mm. after a while, everybody, don't call me. <laughs> and when you say, how can you your business for so long and go away? I'm like, look, if I die, what will happen? Mm. So I will go away. Knowing things can get messed up sometimes. But when I come back, we'll pick it up from there. So I detoxed myself from making mm. the business my life so that I could have a life and yet 
use that opportunity to train the people who work within my business. Because mentally, we tend to tell ourselves things cannot happen if we're not there. But it's not true. If that's the system you create, that's the system you'll have. But mm -hmm. if you challenge your people to try to do things without you, they will stretch themselves a bit more rather than always lean on the boss. And then you never get a chance to have a life. So there are choices we have to deliberate about making. And there's a price to pay sometimes for it, but it's worth paying that price over time to build a system around you that supports you having a, a normal life. I mean, think about all the things I've had to do with my corporate life. It has meant that I could not be the person at my business every day. So you must, once you've made the choices that you think are important to you, you have to invest in building the process that will make it work for you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. I have another question here. How do you handle the expectation of being always on as a leader? You know, you don't have any me time. You're always on. You always have to answer. There's a guilt complex when you're not always on. And what boundaries or guardrails have you put in place over time to help you um, deal with this? Well, you know, that's a choice you make. You're the one that communicates that you're always on. You know, if you communicate like you're so super perfect without vulnerabilities, you, you are putting yourself under pressure. There's, you know, one of my most favorite quotes is it the Shakespearean quotes, which I've coined my own version, to thyself be true. To thyself be true. If you're true to yourself, then you know you don't have all the answers. You do not know everything. You cannot deliver 100% of the time, and which then forces you to learn how to lean on others, to be open about the things you do not know, and therefore you can learn from other people, and to delegate and give people trust as a gift. Because mm -hmm. there's no point giving people responsibility without authority. Then they have no power to deliver. And the power still remains with you, which puts you under pressure. So mm. it's really about us. It's a process. Sometimes it's difficult if you're not used to it, but you're going to have to detox yourself of power. You're going to wow. have to delegate to people and make them feel responsible and accountable for that which you have told them to. You're also going to invest time at a stage teaching the people you want to delegate to. So when you make the investment in teaching them, you get the benefit and reap the reward in being able to trust them, to leave them, to do those things. There's no point giving them the authority and tying a rope to it and still carrying the rope everywhere. You're going to get buried doing that. So uh -huh. those are choices we have to make. And sometimes it's something you need to pray about. You ask the Lord to give you grace. And you must understand you're not the most important person in the room. Mm -hmm. And you know what I always remind myself? If you die tomorrow, that's it. So why are you acting like you're never going to die? And anyway, wow. if you run a system that cannot survive when you're not there, you've done nothing. You've actually wasted your life. Wow. Okay, let me, let me piggyback on that. <laughs> that was phenomenal. Now, let me piggyback on that. You can delegate, but there are situations when the stakes are high. You know, yeah. this cannot go wrong. <laughs> this is important. Yeah. So what do, you do, yeah. what do you do in such circumstances? So there are, days it, you need to, yeah. there are days you need to go the extra mile. You know those days. So when you have those moments where you delegate, you trust, but you keep your eyes on it. See, you have the power of oversight, which is what leadership is about. Okay. Mm. It's also about processes and systems that you've set up. I remember I was teaching a class here yesterday. And this lady gave me an exact situation like you presented. She owns a huge uh, flower business and all of that. And she says, look, you don't want to apologize to anybody for an emotional product. And so you sort of have to do everything yourself. And I said, no, you don't. You just need to set up processes. The guy who has the responsibility to execute the order, if you don't already know that that person is an absolute 
A. Then you have somebody else that will check that order. So there's a control. And when you have the person that will check the order, then you're sure if any mistake has been made by the person who has the mandate to execute, it will be corrected by the control. Which is why you see companies have quality control. They, it's a mechanized system. A lot gets done, but still, because even with a mechanized system, they think that there can be blips. They have a section that does quality control and a final sign off before a product can go out. It's about processes. We will set up those things. You know what the Bible says, haven't done all, do what? Stand. Stand. So set up every system to protect. You can say, look, when you finish all the work, I'd like a final look over. That's fine. You know the moments that are critical. There's nothing wrong with that. Otherwise, there's somebody else who has that final look over responsibility, and it might not even be you. You know? And that's it. Because what you are saying essentially is if you just happen to be in the hospital and you're unwell, your company cannot execute any project. When your business is sick, you're sick. I mean, when you are sick, your business is sick. Mm. When you're on holidays, your business is on holidays. Otherwise, you're never on holidays. Think about it. We can't do big things <laughs> if we tie ourselves to that. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Because I think I think the the balance that might actually be a little bit more treacherous is in the beginning of your business. You're a young person, a young entrepreneur, yet you're a young mother, a young father. You know, they're just competing things that are all high priority. Um, that's where I think a whole lot of uh, people within. Uh, the ages of maybe 25 and 40 really find yeah. themselves. It's a nebulous place where you're saying, okay, so this is young. Uh, this business is young. The child is young. The marriage is relatively young. And they're yeah. just competing priorities. So I think that, that that really has been what has made a whole lot of people in that age bracket flustered, overwhelmed, and, and just feeling real. like... It's, it's yeah, a real it's situation. Real. And, and the reality is, look, it's not expected that a startup has a perfect service delivery, has a perfect, mm. because even the biggest of organizations, they have mess ups. That's just the reality. But even with that, I remember when I had my last child, what did I do? We created a nursery nest to my office as an entrepreneur. Why? I couldn't leave the baby at home, but I had work to do. And if I couldn't leave the baby at home, I wanted to keep an eye on the baby. Then I took the baby to work. And what did I do? I just created a space next door that the nanny and the baby will sit whilst I'm working. But if the baby cry, I can hear it because there's just a door between me and that room. And many organizations now have uh, crash within their organization or something. So I'm not saying you will have a perfect solution at every stage of your life, but you will work out a solution that can work for you at whatever stage you're in. You will find the kind of support system that you might have to pay, uh, invest in finding the right nanny and the right crash, not one where they'll kill your baby at that stage. And yeah, so those are the kind of things that you're going to have to do. And it's even better now in this day and age that you can do a lot of work from home. So maybe you're going to be doing quite a bit from home and then you have the moment where somebody is going to come and stay over and you quickly do the things where you need to dress up quickly and go and take a meeting and come back. You're going to juggle for some time, but it gets better. Don't forget, we're having a leadership conversation. So there is, I mean, baked into that is an assumption that you're at a level. Okay, that requires that you have some sort of support. But you know, for some people, even with all the support in the world, they will never know how to use it because they're so locked into themselves and trusting just themselves to deliver. So it, it's a mindset. It's how we think, it's how we work, it's how we trust other people, it's how we learn to be part of a community of support. And we, we can build it or initiate it amongst ourselves and our friends so that we can all benefit from it. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. 
helpful. One more question before we let you go, Mrs. Aoshika. This has been really enlightening, and I, I, try, I know that a lot of people are benefiting. I am definitely. Uh, we're looking at habits. I like how you said, you know, your mindset, the way you think about things, your perspective about it. Uh, maybe just share with us two or three habits that you have had to embrace that has helped you really get grounded as a leader and, and giving you the balance that you have right now as an industry leader and as an accomplished you know, wife and mother? Well, I think one of the things I consider one of my graces is the ability to accommodate people because it helps me to have long serving support systems at any level, corporate, personal, and all of that. It's to see the gift and the good in people. And like I said earlier, discount the weaknesses and work with their good and enhance it to serve my purpose. And that helps me to have, to be surrounded by a lot of loyal, long-term support system. That's one thing I have learned um, that if you want to go for the long haul, you have to make people feel good. You have to treat human beings like they're important because they are. And you have to be sincere in your encouragement and support for others. You must look out for their good as much as you look out for your good. Why? Because nobody loses if we all win together. Oh. That for me is a really important tool that no matter where I have sat has made all the difference in uh, doing the things that I do. And then remaining grounded. I like what I call my nobody policy. You know, just being a, a nobody, just realizing nothing is important enough for you to feel like you're out of this world for. I'm as comfortable uh, if I'm, if you find me in London, I'll probably be on the train. Why? Because I like it. You know, it, it, I can almost say exactly when I'll get from one point to the other. I remember the last time I came to Pastor Dutola's house to see his niece, who is my, my daughter. You know, I took the train from New York to Baltimore because, because I like it. I don't get caught with the fancy things. So keeping life simple, I found to be, mm. to be a good way to keep you grounded because the Bible says we must learn how to abound and how to abase. And also my third most important thing is being remaining teachable always. And in being teachable always, you would find that you will learn from the old and you will learn from the young. I'm a multi-generational learner. I will mm. learn from a child if the child has something to teach me and I would listen. Mm. And I would learn from the oldest of the old. My friends always say your daddies because I get along along with old elderly people quite very well. But I guess my grandmother brought me up so I know how to quietly listen to or older people. But it's, they're just things about life that I realize work for me. And I like to keep things simple. I don't, I have no drama. That's how I like to <laughs> describe it. I don't like drama, you know. So may, maybe, maybe those, I, there's so much to, to think about in terms of what to share. Well, thank you so very much, Mrs. Awashika, on behalf of uh, the convener, Pastor Tola Odutola, on behalf of the GLC team, on behalf of Jesus House Baltimore, on behalf of everyone watching, you have indeed imparted our lives today, made a deposit that we know definitely we can use practically and will continue to speak for us every day. I took some notes. Our biggest currency is time. You said labor to find the right human asset in your life. Remain teachable keep life simple and value other people and admit that you need them those are real life nuggets to go by and so we want to say a very big thank you again to you for being part of GLC 2023 
Uh, God bless you and may you continue to increase more and more in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thank you. And a big thank you thank to you. Pastor Tolai.